All right, I'm, I'm going because I was not surprised that Joya draws this fantastic crowd. Uh, I'm, I'm Podolsky. I get to help work the seminar series, and it's super honor to have Joya today. Um, Joya is obviously someone who really needs no introduction, and certainly inspiration to so many of us. She's Associate Professor of Medicine and Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine here at HMS in the Brigham. She's a graduate of the University of Minnesota Medical School. Go, go, go. <laughs> He's in internal medicine, pediatrics, and infectious diseases at MGH, and pays her man in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. In 2000, she served as the chief medical officer for IH, as an advisor, expert consultant on global health system strengthening for organizations ranging from the WHO, the National Ministries of Health, through NGOs like Last Mile Health in Nigeria, Village Health Works in Burundi, and Muso in Mali. She directs the Master of Medical Science Global Health Delivery Program. As well as the program in global medical education and social department. So I sincerely can't think of any more qualified to write a book on global health delivery. She went with the subtitle Practice, Equity, Human Rights, and Joya. And I'm thrilled we'll get to a preview of her forthcoming book and consider it as part of the launch party. So Joya, hey, this is a launch party. Thanks so much. And a special thanks to Scott for inviting me. I just didn't really think about it. This is a textbook. It's, um, it's supposedly geared toward undergrads, but I'm hoping that graduate students, medical students, and other people who are just interested in global health will also appreciate that. Can, can we turn on just a light up here because I want to read something from the book to begin. So um, this project took uh, exactly a year and a half. Um, so I was approved by Oxford University Press um, in May of 2016 to write an undergraduate book on health, and I said, no, no. I uh, said, I have three jobs, I'm too busy, and they said, please, it turns out that global health is the number one undergraduate minor, which I did not know. Um, and so there are people who are engineers, who are statisticians, who are um, nurses, who are many different undergraduate sort of life who are minoring in global health. Interestingly, they're not minoring in public health. Their minor in global health. And so I wrote a prospectus at the urging of this editor, and it got ripped apart because, of course, as in all academic things, they send it to your competitors. They send it to the three people who have textbooks on health, <laughs> um, who said, we don't need another textbook on global health. So I was relieved and done. And uh, this editor, who's really wonderful, he, he said, please, just write it back like, like you would respond to journal. And, We'll, you know, we'll get them to accept it. And what I said was the fun delivery in the that as medical professionals, whether you're in nursing, whether you're in medicine, whether you're a psychologist, whether, you know, as people who care about delivering care to the sick, well, is a totally new discipline. I looked at, having read the three main textbooks, are they very much focused on public health? A lot of epidemiology, a lot of biostatistics, and this is all very useful information, but not what a lot of young people want. So I interviewed a lot of college students, uh, people I know through PIH, uh, people I know through family members since I'm an old mom. Most of my friends, my kids 11, but most of my friends have kids in college, many of them under, uh, you know, having a minor in global health. And I really decided, okay, I got to write this, this book. So they accepted, and they gave me a year to write it. And thanks to Gala, Sarriera, and the department for giving me a research assistant, because there was no way. Debbie Brace, who's now in medical school, Vincent Lynn, who was my summer intern, Emil Ling. Uh, without these worker bees, there would have been no way. So I'm, I'm going to just read you from my acknowledgments, which includes so many people. I'm not going to read the list of acknowledgments, but suffice to say, at least Maxi plays prominently in them, and, and many of you do as well. But I want to read you from this acknowledgement because this book is really not dedicated to any one person. It's dedicated to the team or of trying to right injustice and also to the patients that we have failed over the years. Done silence, I watched lovely eye in front of me. Her blue belly, rare and swollen feet, screamed the medical diagnosis quashi or core. 15 calorie malnutrition. Heartache, anguish, and even shame on her mother's face pierced my psyche. Cynthia, lovely's mother, took her child to every way in. 
Of vaccinations, we're all up to date. The literal diet, however, a watchful eye of a child survival program. The only health care available to children in impoverished countries throughout most of the late 20th century. These twice yearly campaigns provide monitoring, vaccinations, deworming, oral rehydration salts, and vitamin A to children under five years of age. I once volunteered in such a child survival program. I lovely. Sorry. Recorded her weight on a growth chart. I held the multicolored chart of the four food groups in hands and educated her mother a proper weaning foods to give lovely meat, eggs. But since I knew did not have food. She didn't own land. She didn't have money. Children do not die of starvation because of mother's ignorance. Mother, when their children are hungry from their ceaseless cries, then their children are dying of starvation when the crying stops. More than 25 years ago, I first witnessed death from starvation. In my ignorance, my relative solitude, I delivered the prescribed health education only to Cynthia and to others. But I did not make sense of a world where a starving child was not offered food. I felt ashamed then and now at the gross inequity of a world with enormous wealth and star children. Health disparities are a thermometer of injustice. The world in which I once lived focused only on health education and prevention. Treatment was not given. Sisters blamed Lovely's death on her mother's ignorance of the proper weaning foods to give Lovely. By standard, Sarah was for contracting the human immunodeficiency virus because she did not demand condoms from her sexual partner. Yet money she got for sex allowed her to feed her children for another day. Pay was blamed for developing drug-resistant tuberculosis. Daily transportation to clinic cost him a day's wages, made his adherence to the prescription treatment erratic. This book is for Lovely, for Cynthia, for Sarah, and Pedro. It is for the thousands of patients I have cared for who are destitute and struggle daily to survive. Their destitution is not a choice. It is not a product of bad behavior or ignorance. It is really structural. It is related to the historic and historical and present day forces of racism, wealth disparity, militarism, gender equality, and others. Their and medical conditions are severe and often lethal. Their illnesses are costly, often catastrophically so. The patients who have lived and died on my watch deserve more than prevention, more health education, and more than what is sustainable under meager budgets of the countries in which they live. People lovely, Cynthia, Sarah, and Pedro deserve quality, modern medical care. Care is delivered with compassion and respect for human dignity. Indeed, the destitute have a right to help. We all do. So that was my motivation for writing this book, because I know that what we all do collectively is motivating to so many young people around the world, not just in the United States. And is this gap between the, the previously constructed, realistic public health programs of growth monitoring, oral rehydration, breastfeeding, immunization, GOBI, the idea of train the trainer or TOT, which uh, even the NGOs will say burns money in trainings rather than providing salary support for underpaid workers, the information education and communication campaigns that assume ignorance of the poor as the main problem, a health problem, that, that rely on behavior change, even as behaviors are rooted in deep structural inequity, that talks about sustainability of health interventions on the meager budgets of poor countries, and rely on cost effectiveness, which is, as always, limited by the GDP of the country. I felt that we had to say what we think, and that's me, all of us. And one of the things I say in the book is that social justice, global health ought to be a team sport, that there's no one person who has the lock on this, and we need to work with community members, governments, and all of us as colleagues and friends. You know, this is really, we can turn off this front light now, this is really what I learned from walking this road, and it was really shocking to me. I was a young, uh, you know, a medical student 
working in Africa doing these these campaigns where literally I was doing Gobi and their children that look like this and chart them on a growth chart and send them on their way and tell the moms to eat beans, you know, feed the kids beans. And everyone say, oh, the mothers are so ignorant. They just go from breastfeeding to mashed bananas. They weren't ignorant. They didn't have anything but mashed bananas. So, you know, this, sorry, this is treatment, right? Treatment. This is a kid who got therapeutic milk, um, uh, used therapeutic food, and in just, a, you know, a few weeks, He's back to life. This is a deadly condition, malnutrition. It's not something that can be prevented by educating a mother. Similarly, I grew up, as, as some of us did, in the AIDS activist movement. And I, the first time I went to Africa to do AIDS work, it was all about telling girls to protect their virginity. But meanwhile, they had no money for school fees. Many of them were orphans. And one young woman said, you know, auntie, I would just say no. But I have no money for school. And if I don't learn to read and write, learn my math, I will definitely get HIV because I will end up as a servant. And if there's some man in my community who's going to pay for my school, I'm going to do that because I am making a choice. And I understood choice, agency, and the constraints of choice. Um, I feel so lucky to have landed in this department because I'm not a social scientist, right? I I'm a physician, I'm a public health, I have a degree in public health. I, I wasn't even by my patient, you know, allowed to take social science <laughs> undergrad. Um, but it is really through the social sciences that we can really understand global health delivery and equity. And I've learned that from all of you, from Bob, from Mary Jo, from, from others. I mean, and thankfully for that. And so a lot of the focus of this book is the care of the individual. Byron uh, asked me to talk at the Anthropology Association a few years back, and we talked about the importance of ethnography and the importance of the single story in understanding the world. And we'll just encourage all of you, and many of my grad students are here, thanks guys, and I gave your break to study, so, you know, I bought your time. Um, you know, understanding the single story is imperative in what we do. And so, um, I have put forward five principles for global health delivery in this book. And they are, I think, differentiating from the story I read in the beginning and and these these narrowly focused things. The first is that we deliver care to the burden of disease. We don't say, well, cancer, not in the envelope, right? Um, schizophrenia, not in the envelope. What's the burden of disease? And then how do we design? And I'm looking at Max because there's no way any of this would be possible without Max. He taught me 90% of what I know now. He's my grad student. Um, I'm like the Wizard of Oz, right? You're the, you're the lion, and I'm going to give you the medal. Okay, so, so delivery of medical care to the burden of disease, and that is a totally different paradigm that I learned in public health than I than than is still being promoted. You know, you have, and we saw this in Ebola. There's, I didn't put the slide up, but there was a young boy we saw in the height of Ebola who had a massive Hodgkin's lymphoma, 11-year-old boy. And our team, who was not a PH team, there were a lot of volunteers from all over the world. They said, "Oh, we can't do this. We don't do we don't do Hodgkin's lymphoma." And I said, "You're not going to let ten kid die of a treatable cancer. Not on my watch. Not our watch." So we got him some palliative care therapy because we couldn't get him out of the country. Um, he survived through. Ebola to end the travel ban and got him to Rwanda. Now he's cured. And, you know, that is global health delivery, the burden of disease, and then hopefully designing the system long term. So, implementation of programs to achieve equity. And equity means 100% of people, everybody in, nobody out, right? Equity is the goal of global health delivery. And I think, you know, so often you see that someone will, oh, this vaccination program is great. We vaccinated 90% of the children, but it's the 10% that we care about. It's the, the story of those 10%. They're orphans. They are ch heads, uh, child heads of households. The people whose parents have disabilities and schizophrenia, the MDRTB. So if we don't make our work relevant and curative for that 10%, then we've missed out on the equity agenda. The third is understanding and addressing the social determinants. This is about social medicine, high social approach. And to me, so much of this is understanding history, understanding political economy. You can't go into a place and not get that. And I learned as much from Haiti as I did from David. 
Hi, Scott. I'm developing a rights-based <laughs> approach, and, and what we have really put forward as a rights-based approach is two very important pillars. One is the pillar that in human rights language people talk about a lot, which is engagement of the community. That is very important, but the, the arbiter of human rights and current treaties is the government, right? The government is charged with respecting, protecting, and fulfilling rights. But know that the history of impoverishment of poor governments has made it almost impossible for governments to deliver, especially in Africa and some parts of Latin America and the Caribbean. Hey, for what? So supporting governments to deliver on rights is a very critical part of the human rights work because if we people should demand their right to health, they have to demand it to an entity that has some power to deliver. So that's a third important principle. The, the fourth is de developing this, uh, sorry, the fifth is really building capacity. That this is not about parachuting in, this is about long-term engagement across many countries and people who will work together for years, decades, like I have with Maxi, like any of you have, that we will be a cohort. You know, I still think about my residency at the MGH and t today, I might not have seen somebody for 20 years and they say, oh yeah, we train together at the MGH. Well, that's how we should look at global health, that this is a large and growing cohort of people who can learn from each other, whether it's between Bangladesh and Malawi, whether it's between you know, Lesotho and the United States. And so that's really, and that means residency programs, advanced nurse practitioner programs, that means professionalizing community health workers, building capacity in a meaningful way, not a fake train the trainer, but long-term engagement. Okay, so all of you, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I think we have collectively in this department, in our group at the Brigham, and, and in the part, Partners in Health sites, we've worked on all of these steps of the pedagogical ladder of global health. And I think we can say this is a discipline. Global delivery is a discipline, right? We have we have rotations for medical students. We have residencies here and abroad. We have advanced practice from fellowships to master's degree programs. This contribution is really meant to kind of be in this piece of the early learners who really want to understand global health delivery. Although, as I said, I think some, because we're trying to change the, the paradigm, we, we may be using it in other spaces as well. So the book is divided into four sections. Uh, and again, Riskful from everything I've learned from people in this department. I spent a fair amount of time on history, and I'll and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And the principles, which are re about human rights, social medicine, not the principles that um, had been, you know, the u biggest bang for the buck utilitarian philosophies. It's a very different kind of set of principles. And the difficult work of health system strengthening, because that is what it will take to deliver care, because the health systems are quite weak because of this history. And then the last part is about activism, because there's no way we can actually effectively do this without being activists for change, because we have to really look at this as a sea change. So the first section is the, ro the roots of global health inequity, reversing tide from the AIDS treatment act, um, and the Millennium Development Goals. So on these guys are <coughs> yeah, I'm right there. Quite, quite cool. quite. Thank you. Okay. I knew Andrew would get one. Yeah. 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 So I think, uh, we have to go back to colonialism and the liberation <coughs> struggles to kind of understand how Africa became so impoverished. And so I talk quite a bit about colonialism, slavery, and the resource extraction that became the norm that built the empires of Europe and the United States, that if you don't understand the wealth that is continuing, continually extracted, and the fact that these men and many other revolutionaries, they spoke about health. They spoke about health as part of the social platform that they wanted to bring about in the post-colonial era. But they got slammed down by the World Bank. They got slammed down by the fact that um, the resources were owned by the post, you know, the colonial masters. And so even though somebody like Patrice Lumumba thought, well, well, let's nationalize copper, well, we might happen to him, right? And so the, the resources actually deliver health care, which is a very important part of the revolutionary psyche. Is that right? Andrew, you were there. Uh, <laughs> health was a, he was. He was, wrote for Liberation News. And this was a very important part of the revolutionary psyche, but it didn't come to be. So it's not that there's no African country.
concept of health, right? I think it's very important. You know, when we talk about behavior change, I know people don't believe in health. It's just frankly bullshit. Um, this is um, uh, a picture of the resource extraction from, this is from 2014. This is not old news, right? $192 billion of resource out of Africa each year, and this trickling in of $30 billion of overseas. So, uh, and then people talk about Africa's dependency on aid. If we break the idea, there's, I mean, there's nothing we can do. This is the dependency of Western Europe, the United States, on African mineral wealth. That's not even human resources. That's just minerals and, and, uh, and profits made by multinational companies, et cetera. So uh, to me, if you don't understand this, and again, this is written for undergrads. This is not as complex as my wonderful <laughs> social science colleagues would write, but trying to get people to understand this dichotomy. And then I thought how in the space of this, with health budgets of about $5 per capita. And my graduate students are very familiar with this $5 challenge. You know, we talk about if you have $5, which most governments had under structural adjustment imposed by the World Bank, which a private sector lens of economic development. Don't own your resources. The governments like Nkrumah, like Cabral, like Lumumba, if you want to spend public money on health, you're considered a communist. So you got then five dollars. What can you do? You can do essentially goby, gross money, oral rehydration, a promotion of breastfeeding immunization. And for those of you who have walked in to a public facility anywhere in Africa, many places in Haiti, some places in Latin America and Asia, what you see is a box of sachets of oral rehydration salts, a small propane fridge with a UNICEF stamp on it with vaccination and some posters for IEC. Who's seen that? That's a very common, just go in the back room, right? Go in, you know, sometimes it's the closet. They don't even need space. Because well, they have one box of ORS. Such. So it's this kind of criminal thing. And for me, it was, you know, I, I work in Africa when I was young. And then going in and thinking, what? I'm a doctor. Like, I, there's nothing I need here. So not a syringe, not a glove, nothing, not even a glove, forget two gloves, right? So this is kind of where we were in the 90s. And human resources totally underpaid, you know, our colleagues were selling radios in the market or trying to do something else to pay their salary because they couldn't afford to work in the public sector. The maintenance, these buildings are crumbling, they're falling down, there's no recurring cost for maintenance. Many Phillies don't have electricity. They can't pay the bills for the generator, even if they're county hospital. And the supply chain is totally broken. So there's no way to get drugs. So this is basically what fits so nicely with the 1979 paper was selective primary health care by Walter Morris. And the 1978 conference on Almanac is nice, but it's not feasible. It's not possible. Let's do this instead. For more than 20 years, this is the norm. So many of us worked in this. I did go be, right? And so I feel like I'm going to hell, and I want to prevent the next generation from doing that and join me, right? Change. Aid activism. Plain and simple. Nothing else changed this. Not data, not humanity, nothing. Activists standing up and saying, you know what? We need drugs in the States. The bird disease in sub-Saharan Africa, and there was no movement in 5, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, that's seven years with no movement to bring antiretroviral therapy to the continent of Africa. And in 2001, there were fewer than 50,000 people on the African continent receiving antiretroviral therapy, and it was thought to be not sustainable, right? It's not possible. Who I E C do prevention, tell people not to have sex. And we all know as the problem of sex, that doesn't work that well. <laughs> when we lost the we come back. back on. So keep I'll keep going. So so you know what happened? Well, activists won. And was very fortunate to have been and still an HIV activist, but partners in health, we positioned ourselves 
ourselves with me and Frene and others to be part of this movement by actually showing it could be done in Haiti. And we provided antiretroviral therapy for a handful of patients in Haiti, and we became part of the movement. And some of you have seen the, the, the documentary that kind of features that story. Um, but, you know, people like Zaki Ahmed, this, this was a, is a, a, a man, a gay man with HIV in South Africa. He was a very strong anti-apartheid activist. HIV, he became an HIV activist. The organization he founded shut down the government. Right, it's down the International AIDS Conference. And he himself said, I am not going to take HIV meds until they are publicly available in my country, the human rights approach, right? So a civil society approach of him fighting, but also the idea that has to be public provision of HIV care. And that created the Global Fund, uh, PFAR, and a whole new era. Of care because if you can provide longitudinal AIDS care, you can do a lot of other things. Because you need labs, um, you need labs, you need drugs, you need uh, you need space, you need people, right? Staff stuff, space systems, which uh, Paul says, but for nice start of that. Um, and this this was published from the Lancet, and you know this is a red time is when I met Rifat at UHO, and we were trying to say what are the synergistic effects of this these moribund health systems. And that work was very informative and started to propose what ought to be the building blocks of a health system. Because really, in a lot of cases, there was no health system before that. So this is work that Maxi knows well. This was us. We said HIV was our battle horse. But the battle was never about HIV for partners in health. Or for any of us, it was using the interest, the money, the enthusiasm for AIDS. And in this new era, to provide primary health care and secondary health care population. So we used AIDS money. This is a public clinic in Bukhan, Cray, Haiti. It's basically shuttered, as you can see. This is midday. Right now, I didn't control for the rainbow awning, and so I'm glad Megan's not here. But um, but if we assume that they didn't all come forward for the rainbow awning, this is what we did. Four things with HIV money, right? We have our case finding strategy in the public sector. We're going to use this money to revitalize the public sector because we understand that the impoverishment of the public sector was intentional, historical, and ongoing. So we said we're going to use this subversively to undo structural adjustment, undo the sort of idea that, that black people, brown people, poor people shouldn't get health care. They should just get prevention. So we did four things. So this is our voluntary counseling and testing strategy, primary care. That's our strategy. So we said we're going to uh, put essential drugs, like not AIDS drugs, but lots of drugs, right? We're going to hire and pay the staff, and sometimes just paying public staff who have been working for peanuts for years. We we'll reduce the barriers to care, which are user fees, again, promote in that era of structural justice. Adjustment, but in the Bamako initiative, we're going to reduce them, we're going to provide transportation, we're going to help, and we're going to hire and train an army of community health workers that may active case finding, follow people, and bridge some of this huge geographic divide. And what we saw was just so shocking. Um, these clinics, in many cases, were kind of closed. People just trickling, you know, whatever. This is their visits. And just by doing those four things in public facilities, we saw that we would have 400 visits a day, right? So, yeah, and it was overwhelming. We had to manage our staff's anxiety. Right, until the, right. Until, the right. until the last patient, you're going to stay until the last patient. Um, and I said, wow, this is the positive synergy, a project that uh, was very heavily involved in, in the WHO. So the positive synergy was using HIV money with an architecture toward health system. So when we talk about health system strengthening, what a lot of our students don't realize is that was a new concept, right? That new concept, really, that grew out of this movement. So the many development goals sort of coincided with the success of AIDS activism. And so the world signed on to these principles saying it's not just about HIV, it's about women's health, it's about children's health, it's about averting death from starvation. And so we said this is a strategy. This leveraging function, who Frank, our former dean of the School of Public Health, calls it the diagonal. We sometimes you know, call it, the, we called it the battle horse. But this leveraging function of money for an intervention to build a health system. What 
again, a quite novel approach, particularly in very poor rural areas. Um, we saw this is some data from our uh, great friend and colleague, uh, Wesley Lambert's BU. Thesis, but we saw just even basic services like vaccinations go through the roof with this approach. So we said, even your silly Gobi thing, it's going to work better if you do this. So you know, we we said if this was this is about lifting the entire system. And then, uh, something that I know is near and dear to Rafat's heart. This is the WHO health system framework, service delivery, workforce, information systems, medical products and technology leadership and government governance. And these are all essentially chapters of the, the book. So walking through what will it take to build a health system framework, right? Because if we want to achieve improved health and equity, right, responsiveness, all of these things, we have to do this. And that's never on anyone's agenda until the 21st century. And only because of, in my view, HIV activism. Second part is this the guts. Right? The, the, sorry, no. <laughs> the second part is, is how do we understand the patient experience? Because, again, if we build from the top down, we're actually not going to get equity. We believe that getting to equity means listening to the individual story, what the patient, and much of this uh, comes from here. So, look, a lot of it's a burden of disease. How would we address the entire disease burden? Let's focus on things that are communicable. Uh, and then I spend a lot of time talking about social forces. This is a, a slide from actually one of our uh, medical students. Uh, but just if you look at the difference in life expectancy between Roxbury Crossing and Back Bay Station, it is a 30-year difference in life expectancy. Uh, the ideas that we try to get, I try to get across in the book, I'm not going to use the royal we, uh, it is, is this idea of zip code the important risk factor for disease and for death. We spent a lot of time in medical school teaching people about genetics and about, you know, not smoking and all that stuff. We spend a lot of time in schools of public health teaching epidemiology statistics. And yet zip code, why? Because of the social determinants. So there is a lot about addressing them, what they are, the economic determinants, the social determinants, the determinants that have to do with racism, and all of those things that make us provide differential care across the world and in the United States, too. Um, one of my favorite of Paul's articles called Social Science and the New TB, um, this is a two-page schema, but it is the journey of one single page, and we, we covered this in class for the grad students, um, how many barriers one patient faced actually get cured, and this person ended up dying of drug resistance and TB. So at each of these steps, if you're going design a patient-centered system to deliver equity, you've got to walk the walk of the patient. You have to understand deeply. And so it's what this idea of delivering the caregiving that Arthur's written a lot about and, and um, the value chain that we teach a lot. And that's the health system strengthening is the third part of the book. Um, and this is maybe a little bit more dry, but certainly absolutely necessary, which is how we have in what I call the global health era. Well, on the book, the global health era is from 2000 to the present, for this movement for HIV treatment access. Right? Before that, we didn't really call global health in the same way. So I'm defining it as that era and the delivery of care. So if you're going to deliver care, then you need the human resources. I pick out community health workers, which would be a little controversial. We can talk about that. Uh, talk about the evolution in drug access. Some of us, like Chris Noble here, is on the university aligned with essential drugs who talk about that important movement to uh, improve the, the price of drugs, make them more accessible. And some of the ways that we use data, because it's about collecting data, how can we improve data systems and really link data to equity, right? Because it all isn't equal. We can use data in a way that we will see the equity agenda. So health workforce, this is $2 billion per year of public investment that's lost. Most health workers and African nurses, doctors, laboratory technicians, pharmacists are trained on the public nickel. And again, these are public, um, you know, budgets that are so constrained. These are trained on, and then they flee because they're not getting paid because they don't have the tools of their trade. So again, trying to take the cost effectiveness and sustainability and really turning on its head. Who's benefiting? 
benefiting from those public investments. You know, Manchester, England. It's Massachusetts, right? It's elderly people in the United States who have Asian qualified nurses serving as their CNAs, right? And so we are benefiting from this brain drain. Uh, I talk a lot about the new programs from the Human Resource Risks for Health program in Rwanda to the MEPI program through PEPFAR and NEPI, their medical and nurse training programs that w that became rose up parallel to this movement because as soon as we open the doors and say, oh, we're going to provide longitudinal care, up we don't have the workforce, right? So talk about that. We talk about the need for residencies. We have, you know, Maxi was running the Mirabalai Hospital that has six residencies. Residencies now. Why? Because if you open that Pandora's box of the burden of disease, you need surgeons, right? You need oncologists, you need endocrinologists. And so we have to build the workforce to match the disease burden, not just keep talking task shifting down to lower and lower levels. Task shifting is great, but it's it's not only, you know, it's only partially good if you need high level care. We need surgeons, we need oncologists. So there's a lot of Emerging narrative of what it will take to build a long-term health workforce that can match the burden of disease. Um, have broken out community health workers for the simple fact that they're still not on the public nickel. Um, we're, we're fighting that battle in a lot of ways, and Dan Pellswell, who is here, has worked a lot on this more than anyone in this room. Um, but looking at the whole suite of things that community health workers add, and we believe that using that community's perspective is better care, not less care. So we'd not like not to dump tasks on this, story, but actually use that cadre to do active case funding and to help particularly that equity agenda. If you're fought last 10%, who's going to find them? It's not the doctor sitting passively in the office, it's the community health worker who says, huh, this family is really in trouble. So we're trying to build in the support for community health workers as a paid cadre, as a professional cadre, and as a cadre that is critical for um, the equity agenda. We talk, I have a few political things in here which anyone who knows me wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, this, uh, you know, I talk about drug access and I try to you know, make global health not be about international health. This is also health here at home. If we let political forces sort of result in costing people out, then there will be no equity. So trying to show that as we look at health as a human right, we have to also think of drug access and human right. And I give a few stories of how the, the fight for AIDS treatment access led us down that path, particularly student-led movements. The, the, the group of students that fought the Yale University for the patent on D4T or Stavudine really was a sea change in global health because they said a university received public financing from the age ought to have some responsibility to provide fair prices of drugs. And so the movement grew into universities aligned for essential meds, which is now a global organization that has not only fought individual universities and fought for um, for fairer prices, but has created a set of novel ideas around a patent pool, around um, novel ways to finance drug discovery that would make things more open access. So that's a chapter. And then Penny for this, for this but the, the chapter on monitoring evaluation is really about how do we use data to assure equity and how do we put the idea of data systems in the hands of regular providers? How do we make some simple uh, simple uh, tools uh, like this one um, to like a logic, a logic frame to say, here are your inputs, here are your process indicators, and then how do we find out if this intervention worked? And we'll help our colleagues around the world to you know, accountable for outcomes, not just numbers of people got an intervention. Because previously, I mean, in the sort of much more vertical era, before the what I consider the global health delivery era, you know, if an intervention vaccinated 500 ki kids, that was a success. But those 500 kids, 20% of them could have quashy and good outcome. <laughs> and so trying to think about how we go toward actually um, healthy children, healthy people as the outcome. And so the last part is really, I would say, about the needed way forward. How do we take what we've learned to this part of the first almost 20 years of this global health era, and how do we learn to move to the next level? Because the next level is really comprehensive healthcare as a human right. We're very far from that. But 
We've had some major wins. I mean, there are 18 million people on the planet right now who have access to HIV meds for free from the public sector. So that is a sea change, and can we catch up in other areas? Um, we talk about universal health coverage, and John Claude Muganga's here, as I said, it's team sport. I, I don't mean to be like Paul and do all these individual shout outs, but these are real, okay? I said that Paul's aren't real. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tool that Annie, Mike Liss, John Claude Muganga, I, and others have developed, which is just to say, what if we really want to reach 100% of people? A catchment area of the town of Clevo, Liberia. How many uh, how many cases would we expect of pregnancy? How many antenatal visits does that require? And then how do we build a system to that? Not to build a random system and hope people show up, but like really map out the, the stuff, the space that's needed to address the entirety of the burden of disease. And Refot's been involved in sort of helping us articulate this for the global community, and we're hoping to be more involved in this debate. This is when we out and, and Refund had a graduate student who worked on this. Uh, and this is uh, in Lesotho, just taking this tool. This is in a district of 250,000. Okay, so you would expect something in the neighborhood of 30,000 deliveries a year. Okay, and and no, not 6,000. Sorry, so so before 73. Right, and basically zero. And Lesu has one of the highest rates of maternal death in the world, right? In the world. So we did this. We mapped out what would be needed. How many community health workers? How many nurses? How many delivery beds? And a year of mapping that out, I think it's like the. Yeah. 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 I'm overheated. <laughs> so within a year, right, within a year of mapping that out, saw that this massive increase in facility-based delivery is 1,700, which is awesome, but it's only 34% of the total burden. So it shows you that even doing this, you still have a long way to go. So you know, I think that's um, that's an important message. If, there's, if the projector doesn't come back, we'll just turn the light. You just come back? Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's coming. So, so you know, this 1,742, uh, which is interesting, close to the year Columbus landed. <laughs> so, sorry, it's not really. Um, but, but, you know, th this is great. But it's still not enough. So if we have a target of full coverage, this could, you know, we could say, wow, this is fantastic. But if if our goal is equity, we need to do much better. So this is kind of work that we're undergoing uh, on what is un what is the delivery of universal health coverage and then financing. But then we move to financing and talk a little bit about financing. And I'm going to show you this because I think what I want people to understand is less about the money, because we talk a lot about the GDP spent on health, like the public funds spent on health. Haiti is abysmal. Uh, but, you know, Norway, they spend a lot of money on, you know, Malawi, right? They're kind of similar. But when your GDP is $471, this 6% is nothing. So there's a lot of pressure on African governments to put more money into health, of their GDP, but the percentage of the GDP is really just a political signal, right? It's not meaningful money when you have set for seventy-one dollars per capita, right? So that's where we need foreign aid, and otherwise the the, the out-of-pocket expenditures start to really increase. So you know, in um, I always sort of urge my students to look at the Gini coefficient as a way to look at how real is this. GDP, right? So if this GDP is 698, but Gini coefficient is very large, it means the effective GDP for very poor people is basically nothing. And we know that's true in Haiti, that uh, there's a huge portion of poor people who never touch cash, right? It's just, it's just a burden. Whereas, you know, you look at um, a Norway, it's pretty flat, right? Most people are around this, right? So, um, so this is what we've tried to portray how you should look at health financing in different countries and understand it. So government expenditure, which is the thing that will result generally in the most equitable care, um, because that's the public sector and that's the right space to approach it, is only 23%. This is about 50%. And so that means that there's going to be a much higher orange box with the out-of-pocket expenditure. And surprisingly, the life expectancy in Honduras is quite a bit higher. Right, because people have access to health. 
So these are countries with similar GDPs, right? Very similar GDPs, similar Gini coefficient, but a much higher rate of net out-of-pocket expenditures. So this is something that we try to talk about is how do we improve public financing, not just sort of general Fire. The uh, ultimate chapter is on governance. And I try to take a unique lens on governance and look at governance from the perspective of the public sector, not the global overarching governance that we see. Um, but in fact, what is it that? What are the forces that are impacting ministries of health? And it is a lot of technical experts that are giving advice, generally writing norms. You have other ministries, most notably and most importantly, the Ministry of Finance that's setting your budget, right? You've got financing bodies that are imposing things like spending caps on governments. Um, there are legal obligations like the WTO that affect a government's ability to do different things like purchase generic drugs. The NGOs, which often have an entirely parallel system, uh, civil society, and then depending on the country, a big or large or small public, private sector. And that healthcare people feel is really impacted by all of this. And the way we've seen success, particularly in Rwanda, is that the Ministry of Health and the government have much more control, or exert anyway, much more control over these other bodies. And so this is a this is not in the book, but uh, I wish it was in the book. This is kind of what we see a lot: is government GDP for health is small, even if the percentage is large, the effect of that goes into the National Health Plan. The National Health Plan hits the district hospital health center with their staff, their staff, and this kind of ends up in a very broken system, and then the community gets more or less health care, right? Um, we often have is a huge amount of off-budget money coming from donors. A lot of it goes into overhead. A lot of it goes to American NGOs. And that work, on a neoliberal framing, goes into behavior change into the community, leapfrogging across this, consultants, six-figure consultants, usually American and European, and these trainings where they pull the resources, sorry, away people away from district hospitals and health centers to sit in five-star hotels and drink tea, and we've all seen that. And then there's nobody on the front lines. We have a permanent secretary in Lesotho who did, was not a health guy. He took her as permanent secretary, and he went to health center. He just would drive around and, like, show up. He was actually a pretty interesting guy. And one day he shows up at this house, and no staff. And where's the staff? He said, they said, they're at a training. He said, training? There's people here. So he goes in his car, and he goes to this fancy hotel where they have training. There's 300 houses at this training. And he argues you people insane, and he closes the training. He's all going back to work. But a few people do. And countries who are in this position of this incredibly steep budget, they kind of take whatever is given to them. And often it is really not building this system. So what a better model is, of course, we believe is direct budgetary support. That's more of a human rights approach where you build up the public sector. But at the very least, that donors support parts of national health plans generally. And I know that this is something that Refos worked on a lot, too helping governments to coordinate and force and cajole donors into supporting their health plan is part of our job if we believe in health as a human right. And instead of the train the trainer, if you're going to put money into training, put it in universities so that you can have significant pre-service training. This is what we think is happening through the Human Resources for Health Project in Rwanda. This is going to the National University to fund residencies and practitioners to minimize overhead. Then this institution will support trainings or, you know, support increasing the staff here and the health of the population will improve. We have this model works because we get the privilege of working in Rwanda, which has done this and has seen some of the steepest declines in um, mortality in, in history. Um, the last chapter is on activism, and I'll end there. And I don't think we have time for questions. I'm sorry. Um, I just highlight a few of the important social movements besides AIDS, including the movement to stop the repeal of ACA domestically, and that to really say activism works. That there, there's no way to keep expanding the envelope of what's possible without us having a loud voice and being willing to stand up. That's the book. I'll stop her. If anyone wants to stay, you may.
Okay, good, good, yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. yeah. Well, thanks for watching the crowd. We do have some time for some questions. Awesome. Wonderful. Questions. presentation and Thank it you. will definitely age well when his undergraduates will tell you they have these kinds of questions. Yeah. And uh, with um, I wonder if you could say more words about the APA and how do you think about the, the lessons learned in places outside of the United States speak to the yeah. that we have yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the U.S. We do not have the public provision of health care. So our our health is not based on health as a human right. It's based on a sort of marketplace entry point. And so and Chris Noble and there are others here who've been very involved in the fight here in Mass for single payer. I don't even like to call single payer because that assumes the payer. We don't call the roads single payer roads. Right? I don't call my Brookline Public Elementary School a single payer elementary school. So we change the, the way we look at health toward the public provision of health care. Uh, and that's what Medicare is essentially, is the public provision of health care, although we still are sort of in the payment scheme. So I think a lot of work to do, but I do think that, that you know, looking at universal health coverage and mapping the inequalities is a very important thing to do. And we have been, John Claude and I, and, and Reef and others are working with Rob Yates, who's a big advocate, and he and the elders going to be in Bellevue today, yeah. today, talking about universal health care in the United States. So I think you should think about the U.S. as part of the globe. And, you know, we spend a ton of money on health. We have terrible health outcomes and terrible inequity. So, you know, I don't know a lot about domestic care, but I feel morally sort of forced to be involved in this fight because, you know, it's hard to talk about what's happening in other countries when you don't talk about what's happening here. Questions? Yeah. You know, 
That's a question. First of all, because I was asked to do it. I mean, I, I, I wasn't like sitting around thinking, wow, I want to write an undergraduate book. I really wasn't. And so, and I really was very reluctant, kind of dragged into it a little bit. Um, I'm passionate about teaching. I believe greatly in the next generation. I think they are much smarter and more open to change. Um, and, you know, I think it, it doesn't preclude you from writing high-impact journal articles. I'm not a big high-impact journal person. I, I haven't written a lot of high-impact journals. So, um, and then... High-impact to whom? The, right, I guess the other question is high-impact to whom, right? The article I'm most proud of really is, was a viewpoint piece in The Lancet that was written in 2001, and it was despised by the academic community because it wasn't sustainable, it wasn't, it wasn't a low impact, you know, but it was used by activists. So, I mean, I think for me, my, I, I'm an academic with a small A, like I'm privileged to be here, I'm glad, but like at the end of the day, I want poor people to get health care. And so I hope if we can, you know, inculcate a, the next generation in equity and justice, you know, I used to teach classes, and I, many of you have at the school of public health, and med school, elsewhere, and people, the first question is, is that sustainable? Nobody, people don't ask that anymore. Right. So there's a sea change among young people to say, it's expensive, it's whatever, how do we make it happen? Yeah. I'm much more of an activist. My, my capital A is for activists, my small hmm. A is for academics. Oh. <laughs> so, thanks, Andrea. Uh, you know, I haven't said much about this, but um, my question is, is, I'm trying the audience actually. Is, 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 my question is, is reflecting on undergrad. Mm -hmm. Do you think the the probably undergrads outside the developed world are part of the audience? Because I'm 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 looking at if I have had a chance to study some of this stuff. Yeah. I, I studied in Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, and so that's also when we say global health, it also helps us just define what that mean means. Yeah. Like working with other countries yeah. from together. How do you so work together? Yeah. We teach undergrads, we try to disseminate this to undergrads mm -hmm. also in Haiti. Yeah. They can yeah. learn this. Yeah. Undergrads in Rwanda, so yeah. they can see or Congo or somewhere. Yeah. They can even see what like open their right. eyes and see this stuff. So I hope, so. I hope so, but look, uh, I know as I'm a Marxist, this is market capitalism, I'm looking at their market share. Um, the reason they wanted to do this book is because they see a lot of demand. So the question is, how do we make this available to people who are going to pay the cover price of $50 I don't, I don't know what the strategy is, so we need to think of that. I would say we're doing <laughs> photocopy. We also are putting up a YouTube channel of different lectures. If anyone want to, you know, participate. Yeah, PDF, YouTube. And so I'm, I'm passionate about that, JC, because not only do I think everybody needs this information, and my graduate students can tell you that for, for a lot of people, let's say Joseph, you know, he, Joseph Siaka works for the Ministry of Health in Liberia. He knows this already, but to actually see it in print, it's like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Right? He's dealing with donors who are saying, you know, do IEC, and he's saying, but I can't pay my nurses, right, Joseph? So, I mean, like, I think we need to get this information out, and how we're going to do that, I don't know, but, but I'm open to idea. Um, yeah. I think the perfect thing for undergrads, uh, I've been teaching undergrads since 19, as a TF, since the early 70s. Nice. And I taught Harvard undergrad, more or less on stuff from when I returned here in 83. Um, and, and it's also saying that the Indonesian undergrad yeah. will want. Yeah. And Indonesian hopefully. Yeah. hopefully. So one thing is that it comes out of this and I choose you to actually push this forward maybe in a supplement is the cost of universal health cover yeah. coverage. Yeah. The qu with quality. Yeah. And the pro so yeah. people have access but the problem with quality and also the problem with payment. Mm -hmm. And this is true here in the US. So sure. with, you know we're doing this study of uh, the Psychiatry's response to cultural diversity yeah. here, and you know, found that one of the things that happened you know, was manageable, but money trumped kind yeah, of. And, sure. and people yearn for free care. Remember, mm -hmm. students have free care. You can make your own decisions as a clinician mm -hmm. when you've had free care. Yeah, yeah. And for people didn't right. have coverage. When the care went, chaos yeah, arose, yeah. and all the different yeah. systems, and so even though MassHealth is the start, 
it's still a problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. California has a disastrous problem yeah. with cows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Asia. Right. Everybody, yeah. you know, every, everybody has a yeah. card if they have a residence, if they have a family. If they don't yeah, have know, a family, right. if they have a residence, they don't have a card. If they have a card, what do they get? Yeah. The grid, I mean, you know, yeah, not the greatest, um, you know, yeah. greatest quality. Yet there is a movement for universal mm -hmm. health coverage, mm -hmm. and there's a movement to enhance mm -hmm. quality. So mm -hmm. really looking at the issues of quality is very important. I thought, you know, put your in the university instead of in the tea party. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and <laughs> it's Dr. Okay. H.O. holding yeah. those tea parties. Well, they kind of went in to try and, and train community mental health workers. They had to sit in the tea party. You know, for days and, 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 and Indonesia, the specialists are doing this and wasting time and not really you know, being on the ground. Interestingly, and I point this out in the book, that actually not WHO. It, this well, came in the case of this, the Indonesian case no, no, but, of WHO. But, but the yeah. whole per diem economy actually comes from the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, which think about it, what's happening in 61, right? <coughs> Nkrumah, Lumumba, Cabral, liberation struggles this of socialist governments. And so part of the U.S., you know, creation of USAID, and in that 1961 Foreign Assistance Act, it says you cannot fund recurrent costs of a government. In other words, salaries, supply chain, right. and all those right. things. So the U.S. is such a huge elephant in the room, as is the sort of McKinsey's, of right. this kind of corporate mindset of privatization, that a lot of it comes from that, and then is imposed on governments, imposed on the WHO. So I think... You know, we've got to look at where is that, that coming from. That is coming from this fear of the public sector, in my opinion. Well, it's coming from the nature of the way those governments are structured. Yeah. So people are paid very little. Yes. They go to the of training, course. they get some money. Again, why are they paid very little? They're well, paid very little because of the wage bill, which is imposed by the World Bank and the IMF. So a lot of that. <laughs> but so, it's also the it's also Dutch colonial. Right, but I mean, a lot of it is the way that we think of funding the public commons. Right. And if we, and that is a very neoliberal construct. And so if we, unless we move that, you know, that's critical. And one I thing agree. I talk about a lot in the book, in the first chapter of the book, is the human rights framework. And yeah. I, I think the marginalization of social rights by the Cold War ideology, the marginalization, you know, so the idea that we think free speech is a right, voting is a right, maybe, in the United States, maybe not so much, but other things are privileges. Like, if, if a government can't hold their elections, we don't say, well, you're too poor to have democracy. We try in there and, you know, help out. Now, again, that's a whole nother political morass, but nobody would say, you know, in a poor country like uh, Liberia, you need to have a user fee to get your ballot. But that about health and education and water. And so to me, that marginalization, which happened during the Cold War, is something to rebuild as the social commons. We think of some of these things as part of the public good, and we don't think of healthcare as part of the public good. Initially. So I think there's a lot of the. But sort those of, countries may think of it that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so when we say we. No, we being the, the, the dominant we, sort of narrative. You know, yeah. maybe the dominant, you know, funder of some things, but not necessarily. So it, yeah. it's an emerging um, discussion, and it's yeah. very, very interesting. And yes, USAID was trying to uh, structure how health insurance should be set yeah. up in Indonesia. Yeah. They, they tried. Yeah. Thank you. They failed. Yes. Great.
I have been observing a lot of movements here in, in a developed country and all debates. It is not thing that it is that poor teachers take it granted, they do work but they pay. They don't work passion to give something new to the students. Like I've been I've never studied a full book. I did not come up here. Yeah. We have been providing a little chapter, some of the some of the notes, a lecture that's it. Yeah. Not in detail. So this I think the book is very interesting and I would request you to give me a copy. Yes, of absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, look, we're relying on you. I mean, that's well, that's why we're here. This department is not a regular department. You know that. And that's thanks to Byron and Mary Jo and our, uh, you know, our four founders. This is, this is what I do believe. This is really understandable. Like the developed and the developing countries have yeah. really, really a different sort of teaching methods yeah. and approach. Yeah. If a school, the publisher has a notion or understanding to just teaching method as well among the undergrads, among the, and this is really very interesting, fascinating idea. Now that I have been working with NGOs as well, like putting on some tea parties, cannot be produced some 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 sort of people who really. Yeah. Work we're working on. I mean, yeah, that's why we have our master's program here. That's I mean, that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. And my question is, uh, how neoliberal do change? The public behavior, you did talk about that. I could not catch that word. You may do change the public behavior and the neoliberal. How do they change? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a kind of in depth question. But, you know, about the time of the African liberation struggles, you have the writings of Frederick Hayek and Milton Friedman, who really mm -hmm. believed that the market would fix itself. And any intervention of the public sector would distort the sort of wisdom of the market. And so it really called for a kind of extreme type of privation, and that was really picked up by the World Bank and the IMF, and in the way that poor countries were funded, they had to adopt this extreme view of privatization. And that meant shrinking extremely the, the private sector. So some, and it's all happening. I mean, it happened in Greece, you know, it's austerity. It's ha I mean, I'm sure it's happened multiple times in Pakistan and in Indonesia, in any country, right? And so in the absence of the sort of public sector, then different things happen, different distortions happen. The distortion of people going to trainings to get a salary, you know, to get a per diem. The distortion of private things popping up Maybe without... For the exactly. Often it's triple their salary. This distortion of um, of un unregulated health care because regulation is also something under the public framework. So it, it really has served over decades undermine governance. That's why I did the chapter on governance. I'm focused on the public sector rather than global governance because trying to empower governments to be able to provide the functions of government is a kind of novel idea. Right, because they are being bullied by donors, by by the bank, by you know, hopefully less the bank with Jim as the president. But I think the neoliberal mindset. And by the way, and and what I was going to say, this department is unique. Right, we're unique. Even in the medical school, we're pretty unique. We have teachers that are very passionate about teaching. We teach social science, which many medical schools don't have at all. Right, and this is because of the legacy of our great faculty here. And you know, we so we are. Part of why we have the master's program, part of why we have PhD students here, is we want to change the way people think. Focus it on patients, focus it on sort of the justice, social justice, equity, et cetera. So I think that it's not just versus developing. A lot of the pedagogical framework is a big biomedical framework. The political economy of a biomedical framework is you leave out 50% of other people. People, right, because they're, it's the social structures and the structural violence that gives them their illnesses. So if you just use a biomedical framework, it comes with a particular political economy. How do I science? Good? Okay. Yeah. Aaron. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about the Center for Human Rights Policy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah. In terms of you know helping people to you know to, to come to an effective demand for health centers. Yeah, it's a great.
great question, Erin. I thought a lot about it because, again, it's a textbook, right? It has a market plan. And, you know, um, but what I tried to do throughout the book is each chapter, whether it's the human resources for health chapter or the MEQ chapter, is really talk about how different social movements have interfaced in this. So look about the medical uh, monitoring evaluation, which uh, may seem like the most dry subject, and yet activists created open medical record systems. The open MRS project was an activist project to say, we should not pay a lot of money for medical records. And if we need to move into the 21st century, it can't be as a for-profit system. So each step trying to say, and my, it's my hope that people engaging in this will see some of themselves and some of their own struggles in it, and perhaps use chapters, use pieces, or use some of the case studies that are available online for free to sort of to help to do education in their own movements and or intersectionally across movements. That's my hope. But you know, it's text. Yes, <laughs> Byron. So historically. It's very fascinating to think about when Palmer and PIA had existed in those early yeah. days yeah. with nothing to do with government. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm interested, number one, in hearing a little bit more just like historically mm -hmm. about the transformation of your thinking to the model now. Mm -hmm. And then number two, there is a way in which to carry out program you're talking about, you need the kind of $200 million a year organization that PIH is, et cetera. My question is. <laughs> Not yet, Teresa. Okay. <laughs> and, and, but the question of, of like how smaller projects contribute to the same thing without taking the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, for instance, you know, one of our goals in, in it is to work primarily in the university but make sure that, for instance, work really in medical health, but make sure that they actually carry out their experiments in primary health care mm -hmm. clinics, mm -hmm. and they try to actually make a system work mm -hmm. at that level, as opposed to going off and doing it mm -hmm. in some, like, private clinic or mm -hmm. something. Which is easier. That was funded by the Obama administration, right. by the yeah. way, where yeah. they, you know, a okay. university partnership on all Harvard cities, but then the partnership with the local type mm -hmm. with the Ministry of Health or with the home mm -hmm. health care system, public health system. Mm -hmm. Don't so, you know if they got the idea from PPH or not, but it was really a thing funding for that. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's a great question, Byron, and I would say, you know, nobody, even PIH, like, we don't, don't take on the whole thing. Right. We, and I think it's much better to do something well and in depth than to spread your work like peanut butter. I mean, I think, you know, across bread, because that has been the model for development and it's failed. So, you know, I think using deep work to have a transformative effect and then supporting the governments to figure out how to maybe take that on. And that's what's worked in Rwanda. Um, I also would say that, you know, what you all have taught me and, you know, over the years, and I've learned, especially in Haiti, is you know, listening to the local people and what they need is the most important thing because, you know, you will, you come in with a million ideas, but it's not really relevant to people who you're serving, you're working with, your colleagues. So I think developing really open relationships with, with people and, uh, you know, I mean, all, this whole mapping thing that came from Max's head and, you know, he would say, oh yeah, we only have 30% facility delivery. And I, I would just say, well, how, how do you know that? I remember this conversation in Wozo. It had to be, yeah, it had to be 15 years ago, right? And, and, and I said, I got out of piece of paper, and I said, teach me. Tell me what you, you know. I could have come in with an agenda of doing this and that. And he said, no, no, no. And because of that, he was working on it, right? So I think I uh, listen, and that's so much a part of the social medicine context, not only to the patients, but also your colleagues. You know, whenever you've done that in your work in engineering, it makes it effective. Um, the government before in Haiti, you know, started as a medical charity and you know, preferential option for the poor. It also started under dictatorship, the, right. the Duvalier dictatorship. It's not always entirely possible to work in the public sector under a dictatorship. Now, sometimes you can, um, and I think that was, it was just a kind of a quiet decision. But 
say is our work in tuberculosis, particularly um, a lot of it in Peru, but also in Haiti, later in Russia and Kazakhstan, really showed us that there's no real way to get to equity without using working with the public sector. So despite, like, the current government in Haiti is not a great government to work with, I would say, we're going to keep trying. Um, and, you know, some would say in Rwanda there are issues with the government, but in terms of health, they're excellent. So I think we, what we realize from these kind of communicable diseases that everyone seemed to care about, that you really have, you know, there was no real way to have equity if you weren't in public facilities. So I relate that to um, implementation by, by means change bureaucracy. Yeah. And it's something that's not one of the sexiest topics no. to try to understand exactly how the bureaucracy yeah. works. Yeah. The first volume of a journal called Implementation Science, the first essay in it said, if you want to really try to understand something, try to change it. Mm -hmm. And what you discover is you have many times that by trying to change the health bureaucracy, you disperse all the reasons it can't be changed. And like, how can like bring understanding mm -hmm. of bureaucracy yeah, and how question. does it change yeah. bureaucracy yeah. to fit on this kind of implementation? Now that's what, I mean, it's a great question. It's not really an answerable question, but I can I can just give you one thought about that because I, when we say at Partners Health and even in a book about sort of public sector, it's very important to understand that none of it is monolithic. And bureaucracy is not monolithic. Sure. So trying to find one or two people who mm -hmm. are advocates for change mm -hmm. is sometimes enough. Right. It's sometimes enough. So I'll, you know, give the example of the mayor of Mirabalik, right, who brought to bear the hospital that Maxi ran uh, for, for, you know, its, its incentive. Um, he really was a change agent. He wanted Partners in Health in Mirabalai. He, you know, removed people from the existing Moribund Hospital. He chained it. He locked it. So, you know, the hand government is still a messy, awful bureaucracy. But the, the, the participant of civil society and one public sector ally, really one public sector ally, what a lot of us put up a $20 million hospital in the setting of really extreme poverty without many death threats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, you know, and, and, and so I would say that's one thing, so that, that sort of understanding that, that every bureaucracy is held up by individual people, and if you can find one or two people, you may be able to shake it loose enough to do something. The second, Max, uh, remind me, because he's, you know, has many death threats. Um, any uh, <laughs> is, is survive your survivor. You're like the, the, the um, like the show survivor. Um, he's a survivor. Uh, <laughs> uh, is is jobs like to understand? You know, part of why Maxi was able to, and I I mean, give him personally a ton of credit for this. Is you know, the, how do you open a twenty million dollar hospital in the setting of great squalor? Right? You have to understand the community. Right? Walking around the community, people are asking for jobs. What are the people want some benefit from that big thing there? So it's jobs, it's healthcare, it's you know, to buy their chickens, it's whatever. But that proximity to the community is a way to get around the bureaucracy. No other major project was done after the Haitian earthquake. Because a lot of the entities that are doing it have no knowledge of the social context. This is what I would say about bureaucracy, knowing the, the local social context, that local moral world, what is it that people want, you know, and, and you know, it's hard for us because we're like, we're field people and, you know, we hear here, oh, you know, you have to have management skills. What management skills? Management skills might be buying seven chickens from the niece of the mayor. That's your management skills. So that's not like recognized here as a management skill, but that is what it takes. Right to break through. Is that right? Yeah. Seven chickens. The same management test. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, okay. So I think we have seven. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll end on the seven, seven chicken meals. <laughs>